Hello, and welcome to Eric McElroy's American Exchange with me, Eric McElroy. It's in the name. That's what we do, keeping it rather simple. Thank you once again for joining us or for joining us for the very first time. This is the podcast where me here in the UK, the United Kingdom, dial back across the pond to find out what is happening in my home country, especially in the run-up to, yeah, there's a little election coming up. It's coming up soon. It's coming up very soon. And the state of democracy is at play. And what I've learned from my guest this week, Rachel Bittekoffer, is not just the state of democracy, it's our freedoms. She is a political strategist, author, and writer, and just an incredible mind who talks about the, necess the need for Democrats to message their ideas properly, to hit them where it hurts, which is the name of her book, and, and be like Republicans in the way they are able to message and get across winning over hearts and minds, but doing it with something novel, the truth, but not being able to f afraid to lean into that truth and talk about our the freedom to have a woman's right to choose, the freedom to be safe from uh, our children being shot in schools, be safe from you name it, she covers it. The book is incredible. The conversation is amazing. And what you quickly see, both in talking to her and reading the book is that what Kamala Harris and the Democrats are doing across the board right now is what she talks about. And it's fascinating to see. So check out her book, Hit Him Where It Hurts. It's incredible. Um, she also has a sub stack called The Cycle if you want to keep up to date on exactly what's going on in the race as it's happening. And just follow her on the socials. She's on all the socials. And they'll be in the description as well. Uh, it's an amazing conversation. It's great to have her back on the podcast. Please enjoy Rachel Bittekoffer. Oh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like the video and subscribe. Of course, that's important to do as well. And, and all those things, share it. Why not? The more people that watch, the more fun it is. And she is amazing. Here she is. Well, thank you, Rachel, for coming back on the podcast. As you might remember, I started this because I'm over here in England, but I still care about America, even though I've been gone for 24 years. You know, I get wow. to vote still. I have to file a tax return. I figure I should pay attention. So the idea is me to figure out what's happening because I'm not there. I'm not on the ground. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about your unique perspective in a second. But overall, how's it going? It's going good. I mean, you know, considering we're reporting from the front lines of the apocalypse here, okay? So good <laughs> is relative, right? By good, I mean, like eight weeks ago, we looked like we were poised to, to collapse into a fascist autocracy. And now <laughs> we have reasonable expectation and hope that we might survive. So okay. that, uh, that should contextualize good. And, you know, this goes back and puts on my analyst pollster academic hat, right? I do yeah. election analysis too on my blog, The Cycle. And when the switch happened, just a couple of days after that switch, I wrote out my first analysis of the year to tell people, wow, this is going to change everything. And mm -hmm. this is what we're going to see coming in the next you know, few weeks. And sure enough, it's ended up exactly where I thought it would be. Enthusiasm advantage for the yep. Republicans wiped away. Huge favorability boost for Kamala Harris. She picks mm -hmm. the perfect running mate. I can't say I was like Tim Waltz was my, my on my, my radar <laughs> at all really nailed the running mate selection. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it's just been uphill from there. So uh, my expectation back in August, early August, was by the time we got to mid-September, we mm. would see Harris with, we'd see the inversion of the race. The old race was toss-up. It's always a toss-up scenario, folks, because the Electoral College. But we, what we were looking at was a was a toss-up advantage Trump for months, okay? Yeah. And then the when the switch happens, I expected and it did invert so now it's toss up advantage harris i expect it will stay that way all the way through here in the finish line and you know what i anticipated the forecasting models to say uh was about a 60 40 harris advantage where before mm -hmm. it was a 40 60 trump advantage so i mean yeah. those are tremendously different scenarios so when i say things are going well that's what i mean and I like to hear that. Um, I feel like, so I have read your book, Hit Him Where It Hurts. Um, and I believe that the Kamala Harris campaign has also read your book because it feels like the stuff that they are doing. I was getting to the point where I hadn't gotten to this point in the book yet where you talked about freedom and, and turning the conversation into the fight for freedom. And I actually made a note to myself about Biden's focus on democracy, which is an important thing to want. 
and then the shift to the Kamala Harris message about freedom. And then that was in the next chapter. So talk to me about a, do you know, do you know, are, do you feel like they've plagiarized you? And I guess that's a good oh, thing. So that's a, why you probably wrote the book. Yes. And how do you feel about that shift? To, yeah. My mission in life was always to make myself inconsequential. Like you didn't need me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when the draft of the book was done and I was on an airplane that was going ah, in, a, in a thunderstorm, I was like, that's okay because they don't need me anymore, dude. <laughs> you know, like, and and that's what the book is about, right? It was about, I mean, I to 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 think about the like the mission, right? Four hmm. years ago, you're sitting there like, okay, I'm starting from nowhere. And I want to change the entire Democratic Party strategy. And I need to do this really in two years to prevent the midterm effect. And then, you know, four years, you know, it became obvious Trump was going to run again in four years mm. to beat Trump. Right. And, um, you know, the best way to do that ultimately ended up being this book. The book has been profoundly influential and it's only been able to have that impact because of the leadership of one Jamie Harrison, who is the chair of the Democratic National Committee, the DNC, and mm. who just pulled off, I would like to point out, the best convention in the history of the party, okay? Yeah. Um, and, you know, ultimately, I could have written this book, but without somebody like Jamie to, to champion it up and move it forward, it would, um, you know, not had the impact that it's having. And I'm delighted. I always knew, like, our what we, what, what most, many of the people knew what I was writing about. Mm. Like, when you read the book, you're like, yes, I've been saying that, right? <laughs> and what they needed was a permission structure and a, you know, empirically based, research based rationale for like mm. why those instincts were correct, right? So it's not, you know, it's not like I, I mean, there is elements of the book that I think are very unique to me, right? But the broader principles of running against your opponent, making sure that you're branding them as an extremist when they are an extremist and the yeah. whole Republican Party right now in America is an extremist movement um, because they don't know, because they don't read any news. They don't watch any talent, especially in America. I mean, British citizens you know, are not also not the highest civic culture in the in the world, I'll, I'll say it, but it's much healthier than our civic culture. Mm. If you're in America and you're walking through a mall or what have you, you have to take 50% of the people you're walking past and remove them from our electorate entirely. They don't even bother to vote. Okay. No. And then, you know, the temptation is to think, well, that's 50% percent of the population the other 50 percent that does vote they must be well informed right and the fact is is no 80 percent of that 50 percent barely can you know knows who the president is knows the broad like separation of powers thing they don't understand it and they certainly couldn't explain it in detail but they know that there is a separation of power system in america people don't know who they're senator is let alone their mm -hmm. house member or their state legislative and that's of the 50% that gives enough fucks to even vote, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Because I think, I mean, even um, as I messaged you the, uh, this morning, that there's an ad out this week from the a Harris campaign that is talking about one of the core issues in in the in the contest about you know Donald Trump putting the judges in place that overturned Roe v. Wade and and took away women's right for bodily autonomy all over the country. Um, you know, it's an ad that's very effective. It's about a young woman. She was 12 years old when she was raped by her father and impregnated or her stepfather. And um, and the final line, again, it felt like it was straight out of your rules, just basically said, Donald Trump did this. He took away yes. our freedom. And I'm like, yeah. it, it's lifted out of the page. It's so clear. It's so direct. And the message is just, it, it, there's no question who's at fault for this. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's my favorite ad of the season. Hadley. <laughs> He's actually made a second. This is her second ad. She did one. And that's okay. the other thing we're learning is just because you used it one time in Kentucky doesn't mean yeah. you use it everywhere, right? So, um, you know, she 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 cut that ad for Andy Bashir, who is a Democrat elected in the very red state of Kentucky as the governor mm. and had to face a re-election across a midterm effect in 2022, right? Very, very hard um, conditions for him. And he sailed to victory. Why did he do it? Because he ran a negative partisanship strategy 
on this ad. And, um, you know, I don't know if he knows that, but I do. Right. And so, um, you know, it, it's good to see that the Harris campaign that I mean, I cannot complain about the Biden campaign before it. Now you can fault what the Biden campaign was doing, but it's just a difference of product. <laughs> you can't yeah. sell joy with Joe Biden. And it's great to balance out the joy and enthusiasm of the progressive young people. Um, but Harris has not lost the thread. The thread is still Donald Trump extremist threat to you and freedom, right? And so the, the, if, if all the campaigns were running this well, I would uh, already be thinking about like, what should I go do next? You know, because, <laughs> um, but there's still the down ballots and we have a, a mix of strategy, just like we did in 2022 as of today. Mm. And it's, it's September 18th. The House Dems have finally put out something that they're going to run on Project 2025, which is that's that's you know mischief managed because that was all yeah. I could ever dream, but we have a couple of key Senate races that have you know yet to make this transition. They're dabbling in it maybe, but not get taking the full bath. And you're really going to need that to win states that are, are heavily favored for Republicans at the presidential level with Democratic Senates, right? So yeah. that's where we're at. And I you know I can't feel couldn't feel better because I just knew these ideas when they got out to the executioners, because I'm not an executioner, I'm just a strategist. That's all I do mm. is come up with ideas, right? But it's other people that make them real. And like the talent in our party is so, so rich, right? Yeah. And it's just great to see like what people are creating now that they have the freedom and permission structure to do it. Well, I think I, I've, I've interviewed a few um, Republicans that have come out against Trump, you know, and especially the ones that were big behind the messaging, like the Lincoln Project guys, Rick Wilson and Reed Galen. And I think it was Reed that said to me, you know, he goes, now that I'm working with Democrats and he goes, I cannot believe that we lost you for so long because you're such better people. And that's not to pat ourselves on the back. Oh, aren't we wonderful? <laughs> but like, because they were so good at the messaging on the Republican side and those were the guys behind it. Because mm -hmm. they went straight for the jugular. They, yes. The difference is, I think they didn't give two shits about the truth, and they kind of yes. knew that. And now yes. they've now they are they're realizing that you know because I think your message is go for the jugular, but also then be truthful with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to make up, you know, Hollywood pedophile vampire blood. Oh, but rings, that's real, Rachel. You know? That one's yeah. real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. Like, well, all I'm saying is, look, they're doing a bunch of freaky shit and nobody knows it because no Americans listen, consume or otherwise engage in any political news. OK, they don't have to in the digital environment that we live in. This is no longer 1992 where things mm. everyone was watching TV and there was commercials and there was a shared universe and there were still print newspapers and no cell yeah. phones. So we talked to each other. We couldn't help. Like, you know, breaking news would come in on your favorite show that you had to watch live on the same night as everybody else. And it yeah. would tell you something terrible had happened. Right. We don't have that anymore. And, you know, many people have self-selected and have been reinforced through their algorithms a complete isolation of hard news because they don't like it. It makes mm. them ill. They don't want to pay attention to it. And it's not their fault, right? I mean, it's our civic culture that's sick here. So when I say yeah. like, I'm starting to look like across the horizon of like surviving the imminent crisis, how it, wildfire situation, right? That with Trump and what's happening with MAGA, but we have a climate change problem too, which is our civic culture, which allows this to be, to be to create and, and to like prey upon the population and we got to fix it right i mean there's just no doubt about it americans and i say this in the book are are, are ashamed to say i i skipped my peloton this morning but will yeah. proudly tell you that they will not be voting right they're yeah. they're not they're morally superior to you voter because they're like ew yeah i don't do any of that right well that's yeah. a problem in a country that's for the people by the people, right? And we've kind of ridden this out now for like 60 years, okay, since the modern electorate, which never really included everybody before, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's time to think about the system and say, okay, we've got to do something different. We've got to culture people to believe there's the responsibilities that come with their rights and that they have a duty to perform civic duty, right? And yeah. um, that's the problem I hope to work on next. That's no, well, that's that's a small that's small that 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 won't keep you busy at all. Um, but the problem <laughs> is you can't you can't have time to work on these things if you lose these these elections. That's because we have oh, to I'll win be first. Too busy working then, on how to become yeah. um, an, a, 
exiled American living in whichever country will offer me the best quality <laughs> of life, you know? Yeah. <laughs> The, the one of those those lies that um that the Republicans embrace and that's it's an ongoing situation and I still don't feel like it's played out is this you know this insane bullshit in Springfield Ohio with the saying the Haitians are illegal immigrants which they're not they're legal migrants that are here and that obviously they're stealing cats and dogs um is do you see from when you put on your messaging hat and just coldly and calmly is this working for Trump and Vance? for what they want to do? Is it scaring people in the way they normally try and scare people? Or is it just so insane? I don't, I, I you know, watching it as a, I mean, as a political analyst, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, here's, the, here's, we don't even have to guess because there's so much footage of like swing voter focus groups from mm. debates because lots of companies waste a lot of money on these, right? And uh, run them live with the debates. And almost every one of those rooms burst into laughter when he said, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the mm -hmm. cats, they're eating our pets. They literally laughed at him and so did Kamala Harris, right? Yeah. And so like to answer your question, like the, the, the immigration theme is the brown people have come, they're invading us and they're going to replace us. And in fact, the antecedents or the precedents of their big lie 2.0, because there's going to be another big lie. Yeah. coming when he loses is that actually we we brought in seven million illegals in their language threw them into the swing states registered them to them to vote immediately and mm -hmm. stole the election for them and they've set that up i mean that's what the save act is all about the republican party is about ready to shut down the government over a symbolic piece of legislation because it's already illegal to vote in federal elections if you're not a citizen, but they yeah. want to use this as an excuse, right? So Democrats wouldn't vote for this thing. And now they stole the election from us. I mean, that's the scenario that we're facing here. It's very raw, it's very real, it's very deadly. And, uh, you know, it, it's unfortunate that Republicans have kind of, you know, cast this aspersion on, on the system because it makes it very difficult for the system to deal with the situation. Yeah. I mean, my only hope with Ohio, with a with a Republican uh, mayor of that town and a Republican governor, I mean, I don't want anyone to get hurt, but things are getting so ridiculous that they're putting out state police now that yeah. it's going to, that, that at some point these Republic, it's going to turn Republican voters who see their community being insane. attacked by Donald yeah. Trump. That's what he's doing. And Vance is doing, they're attacking their neighbors. They would have been better off. I mean, they had seeded so much fear amongst white people People, especially anyone who watches Fox News believes yeah. in their in their and they've been not accidentally brought to believe this intentionally brought to believe that all of our inner all of our cities are like chaotic scenes yeah. of super crime and chaos. Okay. <laughs> Which if you're a city person here, I mean, I got to tell you, like I just, I've been flying all around the country this year. I've been to many cities man. I've never seen yeah. the cities look better. <laughs> And then the other thing is is immigrant, migrant, illegal crime, right? And like they should have just let that percolate. What they've done now is overplayed the issue in such a ridiculous mm -hmm. way that it actually is having the inverse. So like, you know what I mean? With, with this grievance politics stuff, there's a, a line. And once you cross mm -hmm. that line, it has counterproductive value and i do believe that we're seeing that in the situation because the lie is so grotesquely racist right yeah and so obviously terribly racist that the, and what it has unleashed on this small town by the way i mean is a week of domestic terrorism I mean, this is a city under siege why because the pre former president used a presidential debate to tell yeah. 60 million people in this country and or you know others around the world that that Haitian illegals had infiltrated and taken over an American city and were eating their dogs, right? I mean, that is so effed up, dude. And like, uh, you know what I mean? Like the other thing is too, Trump keeps getting shot. Well, why does he keep getting shot? Well, he keeps getting shot because there's crazy people and a shit ton of guns, right? Like we have- yeah. You cannot protect a person in a, your society is not, does not have long range AR-15s everywhere, yeah. right? I mean, if I want to kill you, I got to come up near you. I can't shoot you from three miles away, right? I mean, so yeah. you can't protect against that. But what's the other common thread? It's crazy people who are getting fed this information, this propaganda to, you know, to to rile them up. And some people are not. Some people are going to show up at Paul Pelosi, um, Nancy Pelosi's house and hammer her husband almost to death, okay? Like, 
You know, it's yeah. a very dangerous, dangerous game that Republicans have forced us all to play with them. And and I, you talk a lot about Democrats not being on the back foot and and the counteroffensive and and counter programming. So with you know obviously, you know we want to defeat Trump at the ballot box, not the, through any political violence. And I've seen his um, his supporters coming out and saying, well, it's the rhetoric that has led to this violence. It's the rhetoric of Kamala, and it's the rhetoric. But that is just so. And they've said that you know because they say, well, they say Donald Trump is an affront to democracy, and that's dangerous. I'm like. The guy led. He's in. He's under indictment for trying to overthrow the fucking government. Like, but it's like he, it would be like having an arsonist be, um, you know, advising people not to start forest fires. Okay. Yeah. But as you <laughs> think so, that it's that's so fucking a message patently that ridiculous. People... I want people to understand how patently ridiculous it is for a person that is convinced, and I'm not kidding, forty million yeah. people that the election was stolen. Not only was there's no proof because it drives me nuts. I, I mean, I still hear this. Well, there, do you have any evidence? We know yeah. they don't. Okay. It was the most forensic autopsied election in the history of the country. And so not only can we say they don't have any evidence, we have proven that there is no evidence. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, in, in my comments, anybody who's on on social media that engages with the MAGA base, will tell you that your average Megan wants to jail Anthony Fauci, like really, yeah. really wants him in prison, um, believes that if you're a Democrat, you are into grooming children for pedophilia, okay? And you support gender mutilation. Th yeah. These are facts of like 30 million people, okay? Yeah. So like, you know, it's it's the pot calling the, the and here's why. Here's why, folks, because they're terrified. I mean, they put out Project 2025 online. OK, they mm -hmm. said they said a, a year ago, I'm like, you know, I wonder if they've updated the manual for leadership because I mentioned it in my book and I was editing yep. the book. And I'm like, I wonder if they put out this crazy shit right into the into their manual. So I go online and Heritage Foundation has so much money. They sent it to me for free. Nine hundred and thirty whatever pages of big ass manual. And right? this, is an, this is a conservative think tank that's been around for yeah. ages and ages and ages. Yeah. Ages and ages. Right. And so I, you know, I, I open it up, start reading sure shit. I mean, it's just like from page one, like we're coming for your constitutional checks and balances. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, we're going to eliminate all these things and we're going to purge the entire government of all of its merit based, expert based employees and replace them with our partisan hacks who have one skill, loyalty, right? <laughs> like, yeah. and they put that shit in writing because they thought we were so inept that we would never even, and they were, you know what? For every year until the last three, they would have been right, okay? <laughs> but they're not right anymore because we have fixed things and we've taken Project 2025 and we've almost successfully turned it into a household name, which was the strategic goal I set out, you know, once mm. I read this manual. And now people are aware of this plan. And so, you know, Republic, the idea that Republicans are victims of rhetoric, it, it, it's so offensive to me. They, 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 you know, they lied to people and, and there are people sitting in prison right now yeah. for violent felonies they did against the police on January 6th because they believed this man who knew, who knew it was intentionally yeah. lying to them about election fraud. So. Is there anything that they're coming out with? Because if I mean, it seems like right now there's a, there's a big change in the messaging the Democrats are doing, and it's successful. You know, it's the way to keep going. Is there anything that the Republicans are hitting the Kamala campaign with, and others that worries you? That is putting no. the Democrats on the back foot. Not at all, because they have an inept person as their presidential nominee. Okay, mm. Donald Trump has never been good at being a candidate. He wasn't good at being a president. He is propped up by cult-like allegiance, right? But the yeah. man is inept. I mean, he cannot do the right thing. He was trained for a week for that debate and <laughs> then did absolutely none of the shit that they told him to do. Yeah, And it's not, he can't, okay? He's not going to pivot. There's not going to be any course correction. He literally can't. He's brain, his brain is mush. All you have to do is watch one of his rallies, which is why Kamala invited the nation. Please yeah. go watch one of these rallies because you really ought to see old man can't keep a sentence together. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, go see it for yourself. Right. And so the things that, that what, what they should be doing is branding her as a dangerous liberal and using, you know, her record against her, but they can't because he can't even in his mind really wrap around that he's running against her. He's yeah. like, it, he can't even change his shtick. It's still all about Joe Biden, 
and Hunter, I mean, my God, man. And he, he's so bad. So like the biggest asset we'd have this cycle is the same one we should have had in 2016 if we would have ran negative partisanship strategy, which is yeah. really where the genesis of this work kind of gets its fruits from is my frustration at, at, at seeing Trump win when we could have easily beat him, right? And, uh, you know, this time around, the strategy is there. I feel confident about it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to still be close. Folks are thinking there's going to be this wholesale rejection of all this racism, division, hate, and crazy shit. And I'm here yeah. to tell you the American public is civically illiterate and is not up to the task. <laughs> we might just have enough people who are up to the task by forming this big tent coalition that Kamala is doing, that Biden was doing before her, Republicans yeah. for Harris. You know, there's multiple administration, former Trump officials, in, and, and they're doing a great job of highlighting those people because we need to give other Republicans who know this is wrong. They know it's wrong, but they yeah. have this brand loyalty thing, right? And, and we're now we're hitting them on that brand loyalty and making them question, am I actually loyal to the right product here? Mm. Because I support NATO. I support strong national defense. I don't want to give Eastern Europe to NATO, to, to Putin, right? Yeah. Like things like that. And, and I think we're doing a brilliant job of building the tent for that. And uh, that's what America needs at this moment. This is not a time to fight for progressive values, though I would say American values are almost inherently progressive values. It's a yeah. time to focus on American values, okay? Like we're mm. talking about, will we have the rule of law? Will yeah. we have votes that get counted and certified? Will we have the freedom to control our own bodies? Will we have a government of experts and not partisan hacks, right? I mean, these are huge, huge questions. And that's really what this moment is about, American values. And I mean, that's and that's a powerful message that should cross over, I would think. And it was the kind of thing that you heard Kamala say at the convention speech and that kind of stuff, really, which again, um, I talked to Joe Walsh last week and he was like, this is this is a Reagan-esque speech. This is yeah. not your typical, you know, which obviously for some Democrats would be a little bit of an insult, but but it's hopefully going to cross over and give people, like you said, that permission structure. Um, yeah. You hinted at this before, but I wanted to ask you, um, so what are, because obviously the Senate is in the balance as well. And in order for an agenda to go forward after the election, you know, Kamala wins, hopefully the House comes back to the Democratic side. Um, but the Senate, then it becomes a balance of power to get anything done. It's very close, 50-50 right now. What are the races that you're excited about or worried about in that? Because I, like you said, some people are kind of a, 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 um, embracing your agenda and your and strategy, but some places aren't. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll be frank, it's Ohio and Montana. Both of these states are de-aligning from the Republic, from the Democratic Party. I mean, yeah. Montana's got different. West has kind of been this like libertarian Republican streak stronghold that Ohio has de-aligned. I mean, Montana has a history of, of electing statewide Dems. Tester is the mm -hmm. only current statewide Dem remaining. The last time he was up was in 18 when he benefited from the strong enthusiasm advantage Democrats had in that midterm effect. And the same with Sherrod Brown in Ohio. Ohio is a state that used to be a, the, the bellwether swing state. And then with this education de-alignment, realignment, you know, Democrats have picked up Arizona and Georgia, but they've lost some key lower Midwest states and Ohio is one of them. So these are both races in which the the only way to win is to make the race about a referendum on the extremity of the Republican nominee in each respective race. Yeah. And that is a very different strategy than the old strategy of persuasion. So like it's doing persuasion in a very different way. And it's hard to get incumbents to buy into change because they're sitting mm -hmm. in office on what yeah. got them there, right? So it's not a surprise to me, but here's the problem is that with losing those two and then we're losing the West Virginia mansion seat that will never, I mean, not never, never, because I'm learning yeah, how but... much things flux over a century, right? But for this next 50 years, there aren't going to be another yeah. Democrat election in West Virginia, right? And so that seed's gone and it can't be, you know, picked up. We, If we lose Montana and Ohio, really either or, and definitely both, I feel like we're going to lose them both if we're going to lose them, um, then we're, we, don't, we have a minority in the Senate. And what that means 
ends, guys. And so it's more than just an agenda. Yeah, the agenda is dead, right? But the bigger problem is this reset we have to force amongst the Republican Party because mm. right, you know, where we started was 80% normal, sane people, 20% crazies. That was the 2010 stasis of the Republican Party. 15 years later, through primary elections, purging and all this other stuff that's inverted now it's 80 percent crazy people and 20 percent you know normal republicans that would fund ukraine because of course mm. we would right yeah and so like something's got to change and a, a trifecta loss could be that thing that's strong enough to you know allow them to get the reset because ultimately what is going to make or break that is the donor class of the Republican party. And, yeah. you know, this might be the fourth cycle in a row that they've thrown good money away on these crazy people. Right. Mm. And uh, ultimately we really need that Senate control, not only because I think it will force Republicans to have a Kumba, you know, a come to Jesus moment, but yeah. also because if it doesn't, and it may well not, like, um, you know, Mitch McConnell's no, not going to be the leader. There's going to be a new Senate minority majority leader. And, and Mitch McConnell is a breaker of democracy. He stole the Supreme Court appointment process. That was completely outside of the bounds of normal ethics. OK, yeah. and but he came to have buyer's remorse and he's got buyer's remorse right now because he knows if he doesn't win the Senate it will be because Roe v. Wade was overturned. And yep. he'll know that he played a direct role in, in allowing that to happen, right? But at the same time, the government stayed funded the last two years with a house that can't run itself. The Republican Party cannot govern at all, right? Yeah. And yet we somehow ended up ended up with budgets because he strong armed Mike Johnson into doing shit and funding Ukraine. He's <laughs> gone. Okay, there's going to be no guardrail. And I know that it's hard for people to think of Mitch McConnell as a guardrail, yeah, but he has that is, that is a low the guardrail. last two years, dude. He has been a guardrail yes. for the rule of law and democracy, and he's going to be gone. And so, you know, I could envision a scenario where not only with a Republican controlled uh, Senate who has been granted the power through the Constitution to affirm mm. or deny judicial appointments, not only will they not confirm or deny a Supreme Court vacancy, I think they may just stop confirming or denying any judicial appointments, okay? So like that's the level of crazy that we're facing from this Republican party right now. And that's why the stakes are so high on the Senate for me. And how, I mean, it, so what do you think, that it, what are the risks in Montana? Because I was worried about Montana. I wasn't worried about Ohio until we talked just now, but now I am. So I mean, what, I mean, do you, do you see them pivoting in the right direction or do you feel like those races are just spiraling at this stage? protester and i mean i haven't i haven't checked you know i haven't I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean here's what i will tell you jd vance is the vice president mm. presidential pick for trump within a week of him being picked like it was a shit show of opposition research that is just yeah. astounding right i mean some of the most astounding shit he said on camera was that women that people in abusive marriages even physical abuse should stay together yeah. Right? Like he's I mean, it's cra crazy, right? Rich pickings. If and in the book, I, I highlight the Ohio Senate race from 2022 and, you know, places that ran new strategy and places that didn't. Ohio did not. And mm. I said, you know, but now I've been so proven right. Right. Because like J.D. Vance, I mean, imagine if, all, if, if Tim Ryan's campaign had made J.D. Vance the theme, yeah. then he, he'd be sitting in the Senate. Right. I'm, you'll never convince me otherwise yeah. he'd be sitting in the senate right now and he yeah. wouldn't have been jd vance wouldn't have been picked for vice president because his negatives be would be all loser. over the yeah. place right? <laughs> and even the inept trump campaign couldn't help but see it right <laughs> um but that didn't happen and right now i would say are we in a situation in which the bulk of montana swing voters and the bulk of ohio swing voters do not know that bernie marino and tim sheehy he's the montana guy bernie's the ohio guy are extremists that are coming for their mm -hmm. personal freedom, I would say probably not. And it could happen still, but it would take a singular focus to close out. Yeah. Um, well, fingers crossed that starts to happen. Um, I know. I, I, I hope spring's eternal, dude. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the memo true. for House Democrats to run against Project 2025, that just was like a week ago. Okay. Like, okay. Got to so keep rolling this ball. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's a good thing for us to, because I really appreciate your time. And and the, just one thing to finish on, you know, 
for the average person who dips in, who's maybe slightly more engaged than that person who um, you talk about that isn't at all. So, you've, you know, if there's people listening who they care about what's happening, but they see their friends and their family and they want to message with them, what is a, a, a do you have any advice for a friendly way to engage with people on a common yeah. level? What I do. Oh, know? I do. So that your friends, I mean, here's the thing is like, I don't know why I know that there's normal people and that we're not normal. But if you're listening to this show and if you hear my voice or any shows like this, you are not normal. In fact, you're not even close to normal. You're the 1%. <laughs> and I don't mean the economic 1%, but if you are, call me. Okay. I mean the intellectual 1%. Okay. <laughs> And other people are not you. They don't know any of this and they don't care, right? So you in the casual conversation should use some of these developments like this woman dying in Atlanta because she was left to fester with an infection after a, um, you know, abortion pill, right? Mm. They couldn't treat her because of the abortion law. So she ended up dying and orphaning her six-year-old child. Bring that to speed on some news, okay? And then yeah. you're kind of coming back door into the politics, right? And, um, you know, Make sure that they know what's at stake because they don't. If you have a pit in your stomach every day and have like impending for this election, you should know that most of most people don't have that pit because they don't even know anything's wrong. And so it's our job to force them to, to look. And I do that with my own friend base every mm -hmm. time we go out and have dinner, which yeah. is probably not why it's so unoften. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess, yeah, because if you just go to them, and you look at your friend and go, you can't vote for Trump. That's probably going to shut them down. Right. But if it's more like, oh, my God, did you hear this story about this? Yes. Person? And have you seen what they've done to this Haitian community? And yes. this, this poor woman that was raped by her stepfather and what happened to her? And then sort of go, and that happened because of. Yes. This. That's how that's you the do way it. in. Okay. Yes. That's that's it's a very gentle shift. But, yeah, that makes the difference. You see what I'm saying, though? Like in, yeah. uh, in Oregon, you know, a great way to do it is. Have you heard that they have to life flight women from Idaho into Oregon because they're dying of pregnancy complications and they can't treat them there because of the Republican abortion ban? Boom. Mischief managed. OK, yeah. so like that's the kind of stuff you can do. And there's a ton of other practical advice, in particular, the front half of the book, which really lays out the law and why we have to do it this way, because mm. we got to meet the electorate where it is, not where we wish it would be. And it is nothing like us. Yeah, definitely. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It's fascinating to talk to you. The book was amazing. I'll make sure it's it's linked in there as well. And uh, fingers crossed, we've got just around less than 45 days or so, something like that. And if like you that, want so. to spend those 45 days in a better mental health state, I highly recommend you, you subscribe to my blog, The Cycle on Substack, because I'm laying out election analysis from a political scientist, PhD point of view. There's not a a lot of the variation that happens in presidential campaigns. So this day to day, woo, you see in news and, and on the internet and on TV coverage, it's that it's all crack, guys. Come get the come get the, the news for the week. You know what to expect coming forward. And I'm not often right, but I've never been wrong. <laughs> I like that as a catchphrase. Um, that we'll put that in all the descriptions for wherever the podcast goes out to make sure people can find it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So there you go, Rachel Bittekoffer. What an incredible conversation. It's, I mean, she has definitely led the way in what Democrats are doing right now, and it's working. There's excitement behind Kamala. She's up in the polls, and it looks, it looks positive. I dare say I feel good because we've been burned too many times before, and I've lived in Britain a long time, which living in this country doesn't lead itself to being very hopeful. But incredible to talk to Rachel. Check out her book, Hit Him Where It Hurts. Check out um, her Substack, The Cycle. Follow her on all the socials and all of those kind of things. Thank you to her for coming on once again. Thank you to Mark, the producer, for putting all this together. Get out there. Talk to people like she says. Let's bring people on side because freedom is on the line and it makes a difference. Thank you for listening. Do the like, subscribe, share all those things. We'll be back next week with an amazing uh, new guest. Once again, thank you you and thank you rachel see you next time bye bye